Welcome to Wesley Impact. I'm Stu Cameron. This is the television program where we open our doors and share with you the work we do in our community. This month, we're doing something a little different than our regular format here on the show. I'm the 10th superintendent in Wesley Mission's history. Through this month, we're looking back and celebrating the work and achievements of my most recent predecessors, Alan Walker, Gordon Moyes and Keith Garner. And then we'll look forward to some of the exciting new opportunities we have before us, particularly in the area of media and mission. People across Australia have watched this weekly TV program for generations. It's something I thank God for. But we're looking ahead to a new season and we won't be available here each week, but that certainly doesn't mean that our mission nor our commitment to serving Australians comes to an end. I hope that when I share the vision that is on our hearts, you might feel stirred to come with us for the next chapter too. But before we look ahead, we're taking the opportunity to look back with gratitude for all that has come before. Last week, we reflected on the work of Sir Alan Walker. Now, if you missed that episode, I'd like to encourage you to watch it via the Wesley Mission website. It shares a lot about our work and the why behind what we do. This week, I'd like to share with you the work of Gordon Moyes. Gordon started his superintendency here at Wesley Mission in 1979 and served for 27 years. During that time, he made significant changes to our organisational and management structures, expanded our work and extended our reach in the media through print and television and created a regular presence on Radio 2GB in Sydney. Gordon Moyes used the media effectively to continue to share the good news of the Christian faith in innovative, relevant and meaningful ways. Let's take a look at this clip which shows Gordon's work as a communicator and social activist. One of the Wesley Mission keys to growth is its understanding of itself as a local church on a mission. A mission to tell and show the love of God without fear or favour. This mission resonates with Gordon Moyes. I've often said that on my gravestone, I'd just like one word, and that would be evangelist. Yeah. And uh, that's simply telling the good news about Jesus Christ to other people. At the beginning of his ministry at Wesley Mission, Moyes felt there was a unique opportunity to speak to the whole nation using the media during Easter and Christmas. Under Moyes, Alan Walker's Easter broadcast moved from the North Ride Drive-In Theatre to the steps of the Opera House and developed over the next 20 years broadcasting the core Christian message to a national audience. He is risen. I think the most important thing is to realise that the Bible has a very significant part in our lives. It is not just another book. I believe it is God's word revealed to us today and we need to understand it and we need to learn from it. At Christmas, an opportunity opened to put on a nationally televised spectacular at Darling Harbour. The Christmas story was presented for 10 years in this format and at its peak was the highest rating program of its kind. In his early years with the mission to avoid closing significant caring programs, money needed to be raised quickly. One of the mission assets that Gordon began to sell with great success and immediate cash flow was himself. His skills as a public speaker and business manager not only brought in engagement fees, but exposed the work of Wesley Mission to potential sponsors throughout corporate Australia. Well, I, I've always been grateful to God that I was able to communicate some principles I'd learned in management. And many businesses, particularly in the late 70s and the early 80s, wanted someone to communicate how they were going to handle their problem. After a few years of speaking with 200 of Australia's top 500 companies and being pronounced Public Speaker of the Year in 1984, Moyes attracted the attention of celebrity speaker agent Christine Ma, and he was invited to join the stable of top flight Australian public speakers. Gordon Moyes is one of the great communicators of this city and certainly the century that's gone past. Australians are not known for their ability to speak well and um, he's outstanding. For the next 15 years, Moyes was part of this group, motivating companies to perform better raising money for Wesley Mission and increasing the awareness of Wesley's work at the same time. But Moyes also had his eye on radio and television to regularly promote the gospel and the work of Wesley Mission. 
On his first Sunday as the new superintendent, he announced he would develop a national Christian television program to be televised weekly. And sure enough, by 1981, Turnround Australia was invited to join the Nine Network, where it's been telecast every week since. He didn't seem to need all the props that many professional performers needed. Auto cue and you know, glasses of water and someone waiting on them hand and foot. I'm so glad that you're watching our program today. But Gordon knew what to say. He knew how to say it succinctly. He could, he could say it the time. And so it was a delight. But in 1983, Moy's quest would lead him to one of the highlights of his career. He shared his idea of developing a television series on location in Israel, retracing the life and significance of Jesus, and then marketing those as a video tape set for personal and group study. Finance was the first hurdle. Who wants to put money into a film company that's uh, operated by a minister of religion, particularly when I started by saying, we're not going to have any money from Wesley Mission in this? Uh, well, I wrote to friends in the Rotary Club and businessmen that I knew and invited them to come to a night. I said, I want to show you what I want to do. A sample video was produced and shown at a meeting of potential investors. Down deep into the valley. And in that valley, everything is dry as far as the eye can see. There are weeds growing very high and water dominates the thought of the people of Israel. And of course, it comes out in the teaching of Jesus. Way over in the distance, we can just see the end of the Lake of Galilee. And all of a sudden on that first night when we counted it up, I knew we'd got ourselves a film company. Over the next three years, 36 half-hour programs were produced, filmed on 180 locations throughout the Middle East and Europe. And of course, uh, the Discovering series has now gone around the world and proven to be a really effective way of communicating what the Bible is all about. Writing was just another communication medium for Moyes. At the same time as completing the companion book, Discovering Jesus, he'd also been writing three other books. Over the years, he's authored 55 books and booklets. Every week, his messages are published on the internet with up to 100,000 hits from around the globe. Gordon's other medium has been radio. He was soon regularly heard on 2CH and 2KY. In 1983, 2GB invited Gordon to commence a talkback program. It was a rating success. On 2GB News Plus, it's six and a half minutes past nine. Time now for Sunday Night Live with Gordon Moyes. Good evening, Martin. Hi. Hi. Had a good night? Helena and I fell into the habit of listening to him on Sunday night as we were going off to sleep. And I was struck by what a very, very good communicator he was. When he told stories about being a country parson, he did it very, very well. When he answered questions from callers, he was very skillful. He was a first-rate broadcaster. You, you do radio well. Was there ever a time that you thought, you know, I'm, I'm good at this. I, I should, or people say I'm good at this. Let, let's stick at it. Let's make this the job. What? Uh, no, no, never. Actually not? No, it's like politics. I wasn't interested in going to politics. I wasn't interested in becoming a broadcaster or doing anything else because I always felt if I stepped down from the pulpit in order to go into media of any kind, it would be a step down. Mm. And I, I was happy being a preacher and that was all. You have a, an incredible ability to talk and talk so freely and so confidently. Where does that come from? I guess it comes from overcompensating from a problem. And when I was a child, I had very bad speech impediments. I had to be taken to the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne twice a week in order to do exercises, to project my voice and to say letters I couldn't speak. But when you have to do that, you tend to make sure that from now on you speak clearly, that you enunciate, that people understand what you're having to say and so on. And I think he's a bit of a model for those of us in communications and the media, in business, politics and the church. Speak clearly, put a great premium on being good communicators. He certainly is. I think that's his, his major quality. 
If you would like to learn more about Wesley Mission, visit wesleymission.org.au. You can find help in our community services, connect with our church and congregations, discover a volunteer role that suits you, stay up to date on the latest news and information, donate to support our work and help make a positive difference in your community. You can also connect with us on social media and subscribe to receive the latest news and information about Wesley Mission directly into your inbox. Visit wesleymission.org.au. Please don't hesitate to be in touch if Wesley Mission can be of help to you or a loved one in any way. Our doors are always open and our contact details are on the screen now. Today, we're continuing in this short series reflecting on the work of one of my most recent predecessors, Gordon Moyes, who served as Wesley Mission Superintendent from the late 1970s right up to 2005. He was an innovative, an entrepreneurial leader, a communicator and a social activist. Let's take a look at this clip now taken from a historical documentary about the work of Wesley Mission called The Mantle of Christ. The mission's practical care has developed and extended to many needful sections of the community. In fact, more than 50 major centres are now established. Edward Eager Lodge, the mission's homeless men's hostel, moved to Darlinghurst with six floors of extensions. This has enabled the retaining of the facade of the old Wesleyan church, protected by the National Trust. Our work with children has received increased funding through the community and through profits from Cotty Orchard, a vast property now owned by the mission in Renmark, South Australia. This orchard grows 1% of Australia's total citrus crop. A halfway home for teenagers has been established in Ashfield as Cotty Lodge. This provides temporary accommodation to help them in their relationships and a search for the job and a new teenage centre at Dundas is soon to be opened. A recent innovation for the rehabilitation of alcoholics has been the development of Serenity Farm. Three farm properties provide a home away from Skid Row with the challenge of manual work for those who want to start life again, sober, healthy and independent. Meanwhile, Lifeline continues to expand and out of it has emerged Credit Line, the largest financial counselling service in the country, and Ethnic Lifeline to care for non-English speaking people. Of course, the political issues of the 1960s and 70s are very much different to those of the 1980s. I've taken a stand on many of these political and social issues through the press, through the television and radio and our other public medium. But we've sought to make another impact as well through policy papers and research that we've made and provided to the government to help influence decision making at the government level before it's made, rather than confronting the government after it's been made. As we face our second century of ministry, there are renewed challenges from many quarters for us to meet the ever expanding needs of the city of Sydney. And so we're planning to expand our facilities and care for the aged, the homeless, the terminally ill and the needy in our community. At the same time, we're building three large complexes, the Allen Walker Village at Carlingford, the Frank Vickery Village down at Sylvania, and the W.G. Taylor Village at Narrabeen. Also, in conjunction with the Uniting Church, we're looking at the expansion of Wesley Centre into a 32-storey high office tower to accommodate the Uniting Church and our own ever-expanding administrative, pastoral and social functions, as well as a new cinema and Wesley Chapel. But all of these plans are simply a means to an end. For 175 years, Wesley Central Mission has been caring for the people of Sydney, growing out of a worshipping congregation in evangelism and practical care. We've sought to speak for those who cannot speak and to act for those who cannot act and to provide care for all those in need. And so over all those years, we've continued our basic ministry of providing the mantle of Christ over the people of Sydney. I think people are amazing. We can turn dark to light. We can fly through storms. We can change worlds, but we can't always do it alone. If you need help, we could work together. Find out more at wesleymission.org.au. We are here for you. 
I hope you're enjoying this look back at the life and influence of one of my predecessors here at Wesley Mission, the Reverend Gordon Moyes. It's a remarkable legacy. During his superintendency, Gordon Moyes continued to produce and broadcast the Easter Sunrise Service television program on Australian television. He hosted the program for 27 consecutive years, from 1979 until his retirement from Wesley Mission in 2005. During that time, Gordon moved the service from the Ride Drive-In Theatre into the Sydney Opera House, had a range of musical and interview guests, and remained a constant with the Easter Sunday resurrection message. Let's hear now from Gordon Moyes. This is the last of his 27 Easter Sunrise Service sermons. As with most of our audience, I was making my way to the Opera House. I came across the bridge and I looked out across the water. The sun was just coming over the horizon and there was mist coming. It was a beautiful, beautiful Sydney Easter Sunday morning. And as I looked, I could picture Jesus just walking through the midst over the water to the opera house. And you know what? He was. Because he promised wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, he would be there in the midst of them. It was a morning something like this after the resurrection when the disciples took the boat and they fished all night. And then in the morning as the sun came up, capturing with golden color the mists, they came towards shore and the risen Lord called out to them. Listen how John records it. He says, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not recognize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, literally lads, have you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment round him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. And the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. For they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed... They saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. And Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. But even with so many fish, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have your breakfast. And none of the disciples dare ask him, who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. Now, this was the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. At first, they didn't recognize the risen Lord. But then when they heard him call, and when he, standing on the shore, perhaps with a little bit of advantage of elevation, could see some movement of a school of fish, called to them to throw their nets over to the right-hand side of the boat. They thought they may as well. They had caught nothing all night, and they did, and there was this huge haul of fish. It's the Lord, said John. And Peter impulsively jumped into the shallow water. And then Jesus said, bring some fresh fish. And the disciples pulled the boat in and Peter pulled the rest of the net in. And then as he pulled it up, you notice John said, look, so typical of fishermen, he said, 153 fish and the net didn't even break. He was interested in tackle. And they pulled the net in. And Peter, what does a fisherman do? First thing, he begins to sort the fish and count them. Have you ever met a fisherman who hasn't counted the fish? And he says, there's 153 of them. And he grabs a few and comes up. And they put them on the coals. I tell you, on one morning like that with the mists and the early sun, I sat down on some rocks on the Galilee shore and put some fish on a fire. And it was just as if it was yesterday. 
Why 153 fish? Any significance of that? There is a significance. I told you there were a lot of people around the cross when Jesus was crucified. They came from many countries. I read from the Bible which indicated there were at least 15 countries mentioned by name from which these people had come. Jesus had said about the cross, I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Now he was raised from the dead and he was drawing people to himself. He told his disciples that they would be fishers of men, and now as they dragged in the net, 153, why? For this reason. In the days of antiquity, the geographers who drew the maps of the world believed there were 100 and 53 nations in the world. And they were saying this resurrected Lord is already drawing in people of every nation and tribe and people and tongue. They're all going to be part of God's kingdom. And if we have compassion, we should look at all of the nations of the world. Look at all those people against whom we have some bitterness or prejudice or hatred, who have different religions or backgrounds like the Tutsis and the Hutus that I spoke about, and learn to see them as God's children. Because the resurrected Jesus who died upon a cross died for the sins of all of the world. And he rose from the dead to give life and forgiveness of sins to people of every culture and every nation because Easter belongs to all cultures. How? Well, there's another new film that's being launched this week around Australia. It's a film called Luther. It tells the story of that mighty man who rediscovered in the Bible a great truth. And as a result, people have been proclaiming it ever since. That is, you get right with God by God's grace through faith. Over and over again in the film Luther, this is a, a key theme, and it's a theme that comes from the Bible. As John wrote elsewhere, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And John's Gospel puts it very bluntly that if we believe in the name of God's one and only Son, we will be saved. Jesus is God's one and only Son. All men everywhere, men, women, children, are creatures of God. The Bible tells us that we are created by the Creator and we are His creatures. But John says, but to as many who believe in him, Jesus, he gives them the power to become children of God. We're no longer creatures, we're his children. And the great Easter message is that around the cross, there were people from many nations, many tribes, many languages, with all sorts of prejudice and hostility. But there came with the death of Jesus upon the cross a wave greater than any tsunami. It was not the passion of Christ that made the difference. It was the compassion of Christ. And now there is a new love released into the world, a love that crosses the barrier of nation and class and color and race and creed. And all we need to do is to believe in the risen Jesus. The story of Easter is for all cultures. The story of Easter is for all countries. The story of Easter is for all the 153 nations of earth. Because in Jesus Christ, you can find through the message of the cross and the resurrection, forgiveness of your sin. You can find a gift of life that is eternal and abundant and free. And you'll find a friendship with Jesus.
as he comes to you across the sea and he promises to be your friend forever. At Wesley Mission, we see kindness change kids' worlds. You can find out more at wesleymission.org.au. We are here for you. Next week, we continue our journey through our TV history and we'll look at the work of my most recent predecessor, Reverend Keith Garner. Keith's faithful leadership has made Wesley Mission the organisation it is today and left big shoes for me to fill. Now, as always, if Wesley Mission can be of help to you or a loved one in any way, please don't hesitate to be in touch. Our doors are always open and we are always ready to lend a helping hand wherever we can. I hope you can join us again next week here on Wesley Impact. Every blessing to you and to those whom you love. Wesley Mission walks alongside people of all ages struggling with homelessness, addictions, mental health issues and financial stress. To find out more, visit wesleymission.org.au.